Uh, okay, uh, we're talking about custody. Uh, fascinating topic, custody. Uh, as I told you before, of course, I was in a custody battle with my uh, with the uh, Baptist minister. Uh, yeah, with the yeah, with that guy, and then my daughter, of course, was fighting with her with the father of her child over custody. Uh, most custody evaluations include the following components. Uh, they, have, they look at the clinical history of the, of the individuals we're dealing with, the social history, the mental status interviews of the parents and the children, so they want to determine if there has, it has been a problem in the past. Standardized testing for parent, of parents and the child uh, or the children. Observation of interactions between each parent and children, especially minors. Um, after the age of 12, of course, the children can decide whether they want to go with their mother or their father. It uh, doesn't automatically, uh, the individuals don't automatically go with the, uh, uh, with the females. Sometimes uh, families will divide up the children, and the males will go with the father, and the females will go with the mother. I, you know, it's really kind of interesting that way. Uh, assessments or interviews with people who have observed the family. Uh, usually the, this deals with neighbors, uh, sometimes relatives. Uh, at my daughter's hearing, uh, the only witness they called was my, my son, uh, was the uncle of the, of the child. Uh, that was kind of interesting. Uh, documents or records that might be uh, relevant to the case. And the question was, uh, the question that they asked him was, of course he was living down there in the, and teaching at the same school that she was teaching at. Uh, but both of them lost their jobs last year. Uh, so they both needed new jobs. Uh, he took a job uh, across town, and she took a job in Iowa. And, uh, wow, it was a tough one. We, we needed to get her moved to Iowa, and we couldn't move her until the courts decided that she could leave the state. I was pissed. You can imagine how upset I was. It was like she was being incarcerated in the state of Florida in that swamp. It's kind of like Papillon. If you've ever seen the movie Papillon. <laughs> they, they send the guy to Devil's Island. It's kind of the same situation. My poor daughter had to live in Florida. She, of course she loves Florida, but to me it's, a, it's hot in the summertime. And it's a swamp. The damn place is a swamp. You can quote me if you like. I don't have to worry about the courts anymore. Frequency of different kinds of custodial arrangement. Uh, 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 most commonly, the uh, the joint legal custody about 42.8 percent. That, that's the the one that uh, we see the most frequently. Uh, sole custody with visitation rights 30.4 uh, uh, percent. Joint physical custody 21.7 percent. So where they trade, you know, 50-50. Uh, doesn't happen all that frequently. Sole custody without visitation only happens in about 4.6% of the time. One of the things that we do know is that uh, um, uh, children do better with two parents. We, we already know that's true. Uh, so they try not to, to keep the father away from the, the family. Uh, the only time they will normally is when the uh, uh, father has uh, some kind of a drug conviction potentially or a, uh, a sexual uh, assault conviction, uh, some kind of a sexual uh, conviction, especially pedophilia. But they certainly want to keep the, the uh, father away from the children. Assessment in custody uh, disputes. Many judges require uh, divorcing couples to attempt to settle issues of custody, visitation, and support through mediation. And this is what happened with my daughter and the father of her child. Uh, they went through mediation, and as it turned out, he had to pay for the mediator. Uh, I can't remember how that, why that worked out the way it did. Um, by, oh, yes, I do know why it worked out the way it did. Because he thought if he hired the mediator, the mediator would, would uh, favor him yeah, in the mediation, and it didn't work out that way. If mediation fails, then they have to go to court, and of course that's what you try to stay away from. Uh, relatively expensive uh, going to court and the judge of course will decide the issues. Uh, the uh, mediator was a female and, as was the judge. Uh, so he, he felt like he was being railroaded by the females of the world who were all massing against him uh, to take his child away from him. 
The benefits of custody mediation are that the resolutions are reached more quickly and uh, with better compliance as far as the uh, as far as that goes, because they, they there is a mediation process. If it's just the judge, the judge makes makes a decision, and there's no question as to what happens next. The state must uh, protect children from parents who do not provide adequate food, shelter, and supervision, or who abuse them physically or psychologically. And of course, this is uh, one of the reasons why we have the custody hearings to begin with. Uh, if um, neither parent wants to take care of the child and they're not doing a very good job of taking care of the child, uh, then the child will be put in protective custody of, well, in, uh, Child Protective Services will, will take the child away from the parents. I have a question. Can they be given to the parents of the mother or father? Right, yeah. What they try to do is they try to keep the child in the family if possible. But they have to find someone who's willing to do it. An aunt, an uncle, whatever. Uh, different rules on the reservation. Uh, because uh, uh, once upon a time they were, they were snatching kids off the reservation and sending them to places like Utah, what well, here in uh, Utah. Uh, up at Fort Belknap, they were uh, taking the kids off the reservation and sending them to farmers uh, to, as laborers, as strange as that seems, or whatever. Uh, and, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Uh, I had a student who, um, she was the oldest one in the family. And there were five of them. Yeah, there were five of them. And uh, they, that's what they did with them. Uh, they separated all the kids, all five of the children, went to somebody, somebody else. And uh, two of the children maintained their native identity. <clears throat> and three of the children refused to be considered native. I know, they lost their, their cultural identity. I know, it's really kind of sad. And they, that happened frequently enough that they decided they realized that we were changing people's culture, we were changing who they are, uh, so they stopped doing that. Now there is a law that states that uh, uh, if they take somebody off the reservation, they have to try to keep the person off the, on the reservation. Uh, so they, they look for relatives now uh, who can, uh, who can uh, take care of the children. Oh, okay, so uh, yeah, if the uh, parents aren't taking care of the children, then they will take the Child Protective Services will uh, take custody of the child. Uh, that's what they tried to do to me, of course. The state of Texas was trying to take my children away. They really didn't have much of a case, except that I didn't go to church. That was it. And of course, that was enough for the judge. A clinician might recommend temporary foster care and the parents receive training in parenting skills or in extreme cases they may seek to terminate parental rights, which the courts can do. Uh, if neither parent is taking care of the child, uh, they, can, uh, they can terminate the parental rights of, of the, the uh, parents and put them in a, uh, a more wholesome uh, atmosphere. Uh, one of the things that did happen with my uh, with my daughter and her the father of her child, they did have to go through uh, uh, parent skills training, and of course, both of them are relatively good parents, so that was not that big a deal. All 50 states and the, and the District of Columbia have civil commitment uh, laws. We're, we're not talking about custody anymore. We're going to talk about civil commitment. Um, it authorizes the custody and restraint of persons who, as a result of mental illness, are a danger to themselves or others, or who are so gravely disabled that they cannot care for themselves, and in, in which case they will be put uh, in a, um, an, uh, an institution of one kind or another, maybe a nursing home uh, to take care of them, or maybe a mental hospital uh, to take care of them. Um, this uh, has to do with money, uh, and for this reason, uh, Civil commitment is, is sometimes uh, relatively controversial. A uh, family will try to have somebody committed uh, because, they're, because of their erratic behavior. Uh, I guess my wife could try to have me committed since I act so goofy sometimes, I know. <laughs> and the question is, uh, could she do it? I mean, could she actually do it? Uh, it's not like I'm worth anything, but uh, I guess she could try to get me committed so that maybe she could divorce me and and marry that uh, handsome guy that keeps hitting on it. 
I like to think I'm the handsome guy that keeps hitting over, but that's not true. Beginning around 1970, commitment proceedings uh, began to be reformed, resulting in more legal rights for the mentally ill to resist compulsory commitment. Once upon a time, it was easy to commit somebody. All you needed to do was find them, uh, was to declare them erratic. Uh, all you needed to do was to find a, a, uh, a mental health practitioner who would uh, say, yeah, he's not easy to prove that's all you needed. Uh, but now, since 1970, uh, of course, their rights have expanded, the rights of the mentally ill. 1975, the Supreme Court held that mental illness and a need for treatment were insufficient justifications for involuntary committing uh, mentally ill persons who were not dangerous. So the question is, how dangerous are these individuals? And if they are dangerous, uh, one of the, somebody just shot somebody Oh, it was the guy in uh, uh, just north of, of um, uh, Denver uh, that shot up Walmart, killed three people, uh, wounded six. Um, they, uh, his sister testified uh, that uh, 15 years ago he dropped some acid, some LSD, and since then his behavior has become erratic. And she claims that that is the problem. Uh, the fact that he dropped some acid and now he's schizophrenic. Uh, so, I know that helps, doesn't it? Now we know what's wrong with this guy. Uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, yesterday's newspaper was just horrible. I'm going to read you some of the stories in the, in, the, in the paper, as horrible as that may seem. But let me get through this chapter first and you know, we'll talk about what happened yesterday in the world. Anyway, danger is, the, is the, the question. Are they a danger to themselves or are they a danger to other people? Uh, every time a, a mass shooting takes place, uh, we claim that they, the people were insane. Uh, we hope that the people were insane because sane people shouldn't be killing 59 people in Las Vegas or target a, a, uh, yeah, a concert. A I don't think it was a free concert. It was they had to pay, so they were they had they were funneling them uh, through uh, entrances and exits, uh, and that was the problem. They couldn't get away. Similar limits on involuntary hospitalizations have been upheld by the Supreme Court in the 1990s. Uh, Falsha versus uh, Louisiana, 1992, is a good example. The standard of uh, for commitment changed from mental illness and in the need of treatment to, to mental illness that was associated with dangerousness or a grave lack of ability to care for oneself. And that happened in the 1990s. So through the, from the 1970s through the 1990s, uh, the Supreme Court, that we kept trying to get the Supreme Court to hear cases so that we would know exactly what was supposed to happen. Uh, there are some states that uh, do not deal well with mental illness, and there are other states that deal very well with mental illness. So the question was, you know, if you go wacko in Louisiana, what's going to happen next? And that's one of the reasons why the, uh, the Fauci versus Louisiana case was so important. Uh, the southern states tend to not be very good at uh, dealing with mental illness. Uh, this is right after civil rights. Civil rights were passed in the 1960s and in the 1970s. But uh, if you visited the South, which I did on several occasions, if you visited the, the South, one of the things you discovered was that uh, despite the fact that all these laws had been written by the Supreme Court and been passed by the Congress, uh, it really didn't make a whole hell of a lot of difference as far as racial uh, civil rights were concerned, as far as, as racism was concerned. Uh, the racism was still very real. When I was living in Mississippi in the 1990s, uh, I was there from 1995 through 1996. 98. Uh, one of the things we d I discovered was they had two mental hospitals there. One of them was for black people and one of them was for white people. Well, this was against the law. So how in the world do you stop this kind of stuff? Somebody has to bring a lawsuit. And of course, I didn't have the money to bring a lawsuit. And I, was only going to, I knew I was only going to be there for a couple of years because I was in the military, and my wife was in the military. So what do you do? Well, unless somebody in the state is willing to, to stand up and, and uh, to do something about it, there's nothing in the world that you can do. 
Uh, they still were. They still had segregated uh, education in uh, in, Missis in select places in Mississippi. Other places they were integrated, but uh, there were still uh, segregated schools. What do you do about it? Well, there's nothing you can do about it. The state has to do something about it. And of course, now, right now, we've got this huge argument going on about a, a man running for the Senate from from Alabama, a man who. Who seemingly, uh, <laughs> who apparently, or I don't know, it all depends on who you read, uh, targets uh, underage girls. Uh, he, this was when he was in his 30s, he targeted un underage girls, uh, tried to seduce them, uh, high school girls, 16 year olds, 14 year olds. Uh, he was put on a, a watch list at a mall because he. Uh, he would follow young women and try to pick them up. It's kind of like a 30-year-old going to a junior high drinking party or something, trying to pick up chips. You know, I, as gross as that seems. And he's running for Senate uh, on the Republican ticket. Uh, the Democrat, of course, there's a Democrat that's running as well, but uh, it looks like, well, we don't know what's going to happen. But this is something to watch. And I'll be talking about underage sex in just a second. It's, it was in the paper, yesterday's paper. It was god awful as this is. Anyway, so the question is uh, how dangerous are they to themselves or to somebody else? Uh, do they have 18,000 rounds of ammunition in their, in their, uh, uh, in their shed with uh, AK 47 or whatever? Or whatever, I don't know. AR 15. Do they have a military weapon that they want to take someplace? Wow, so many shootings here lately. My goodness gracious. Uh, the laws permit four types of civil commitments. Emergency detention um, is the most common way that individuals are initially admitted to the hospital. Uh, emergency de detention because the individual is acting erratically and uh, they do pose a danger either to themselves or to others. Uh, voluntary inpatient commitment. Uh, that is, is relatively common as well. Uh, the individual realizes that there's something wrong and so they, uh, invo they voluntarily commit themselves. Involuntary commitment, uh, this requires a court order uh, in, in order to take somebody off the street that does seem to pose a danger either to themselves or to somebody else. And outpatient commitment uh, is, the, uh, is the fourth type. The terms dangerous and dangerousness uh, merge three distinct constructs. Uh, one question is risk factors, variables associated with probability that violence or aggression will occur. Those are the risk factors that we have to talk about. Harm, uh, what is harm? If somebody punches you, is that harm? Uh, and of course, it all depends on the severity. If I punch, uh, punch him. There we go. Okay, so how much harm did I do to Curtis by punching him in the shoulder? Uh, you know, we're buddies, so I could punch him in the shoulder, he punches me back in the shoulder, and it's just the way that we, we uh, interact. Uh, well, so the question is how much harm was done? Uh, you know, is, was there blood involved? Was there bruising? Was there, uh, was there teeth that were lost or whatever? And that has to do with harm. Risk, risk level, the probability that harm will occur again, or that they will, uh, they will, are possibly going to harm somebody else. If they have 18,000 rounds of ammunition, the probability of harm, the risk factors are relatively high. If they are starting to act erratically and they're starting to threaten people, uh, I've got a, a story about a man with a, with a gun in another Walmart in, kind of, in Colorado again. Oh my God. Uh, clinicians who, who perform risk assessments uh, try to predict which person's uh, are, are and are not likely to behave violently in certain circumstances. And one of the things we will, we will discover is that uh, every time we have one of these shootings, it turns out that someone has evaluated this individual and found them to be relatively lucid and not dangerous. The risk factors were low. Maybe they didn't realize the individual was armed with an AR-15 or an AK-47. Or they had 35 handguns at home. As it turns out, it seems like these people become obsessed with weaponry uh, to the extent that they're 
back seat is full of all kinds of wonderful weapons and ammunition. As we found out, uh, the guy that uh, shot up uh, Las Vegas fired 4,000 rounds, and he still had, uh, I don't know, what was it, 11,000 rounds left that he didn't fire. Really interesting. The guy that shot up the church, uh, man, he reloaded over and over and over again. He shot over 400 rounds, and he wasn't in there for very long. But uh, he was walking up and down the aisle and shooting people in the head, and that's one of the reasons why so many people died. Uh, he was shooting children. Uh, normally, you know, there's no normal to it, I guess. Uh, usually, they, they don't target children. People do not target children. But uh, this, this individual did, for some reason. Uh, he had lost custody of his children, and he blamed his in-laws for, for, for him losing custody of his children. Uh, okay, so the, the, um, the job of the clinician is to give some uh, estimate of the risk for violence, uh, offer suggestions on how to reduce the risks. Of course, there is a, there is a danger to the clinician as, uh, also, uh, because if they, uh, if they say, well, there's, there is a high probability of violence from this individual, that individual can sue them, and that's always a problem. That's, that's always a potential problem. And this is one of the reasons why they tend to be a little bit conservative uh, when it comes to uh, uh, assessing risk factors and saying something about somebody else. The guy can sue them for liability, or not li uh, for libel, I'm sorry, for libel. <laughs> liability. Uh, the base rate of violence in some groups is low, so clinicians are being asked to predict a phenomenon that rarely occurs. Uh, what's the most dangerous group of people in the United States? The ones that seem to be shooting people? White people are the most dangerous people in the United States. They seem to be armed and dangerous and crazy at the same time. Seems a little odd, doesn't it? That maybe it's that Viking blood. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> Vikings. Vikings are, are really interesting people. They wandered all over the, the world conquering people, and uh, if they got into battle with people, sometimes they would just go, they'd get bloodlust, and they'd go insane and just start chopping people into dime-sized pieces. Vikings. You think I'm kidding. I know. So where do these people come from? Well, they come from Northern Europe. Denmark. Norway, Sweden, those, those were the Vikings. And some of the English, of course, the Vikings conquered parts of, of England. Uh, so some of the English have this, here I'm picking on this, the Scandinavians, I probably should be careful on, since I'm on tape. I don't know, I have no idea what's going on with these people. I don't know why white people are more dangerous than anybody else. But I can speculate if I like. They do seem to be angry and dangerous. So I guess I'm the most dangerous person in this world. A little old. Except that guy that shot up Las Vegas is 64. I don't know. When does your testosterone get so low that you're no longer a danger to everybody? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, clinical assessments of persons are often conducted in hospitals or prisons, whereas uh, one needs to know risk violence in the community, of course, uh, it's easy to talk to these people in prisons uh, in order to, for them to control them. Sometimes they give them, they put chemicals in their food. They used to do this with military people. And uh, this was during Vietnam, in the early parts of Vietnam. <laughs> uh, the predictions uh, have often been for long-term risk, which is harder to predict than violence risk over a shorter time frame. If you have an individual that's violent, has been violent in the past, it's time for parole. We have to determine if they are still a danger to the community. One of the things, uh, I was a consultant with a friend of mine in Ohio. Uh, his job was uh, working with uh, sexual uh, people who had committed sexual crimes. That was his job. Fascinating guy. Uh, pretty man, he was very attractive, he was uh, a stripper, 
and that's how he got into the job. <laughs> I know, this sounds really kind of strange. Anyway, uh, and his wife, that's how he met his wife. Uh, he was a stripper. And he got his master's degree in, uh, in psychology, and uh, this was what he did. Uh, nobody else wanted to work with these jerks, these creeps, uh, the rapists and the, uh, the uh, child molesters. Nobody wanted to work with him, so he did. And uh, he was really actually very good. And uh, he would call me in to select cases from time to time. Uh, sometimes, you know, he was dealing with slime all the time. So he would lose his perspective. He would, uh, you know, his hands got so dirty he couldn't do anything. So he would call me in and, and ask me to evaluate somebody. It was really kind of fascinating, uh, fascinating work, work. But one of the things you have to determine is if you've got a pedophile, can you let him out of prison? Are they just going to uh, start uh, uh, abusing children again? That's the question that you have to, you have to ask yourself and answer. Well, the, the whole thing has come up with uh, O.J. Simpson. It's not a child molester, of course, but O.J. Simpson uh, committed a, a relatively violent crime, uh, and they just laid him out of prison. They had to, had to decide whether he was still a danger to society or not. Of course, O.J. Simpson is my age. Yeah, I think he graduated from college in 68, so he's a couple years older than I am, actually. Clinicians should... Uh, have information about a range of historical, personal, and, and environmental violence-related variables. They need to limit their predictions to specific kinds of violent behavior. Uh, they need to concentrate on appraising risks based on specific settings. And of course, as I was saying, my friend, uh, that was what he did. He, uh, uh, he limited himself to uh, sex crimes. Uh, and of course, like, and nobody else wanted to do it. That's one of the reasons why I did it. Uh, one of the most important advances in the area of risk assessment has involved the, the development and the use of such specialized risk assessment tools as we were talking about before. Evidence indicates that good actuarial and structured professional judgment approaches uh, to risk assessment are comparably accurate in predictions of violence. And of course, uh, one of the toughest jobs that psychologists have is trying to determine if somebody is, is still a danger to society or not. Okay, that is the end of chapter 11. So we're going to start chapter 12 eventually. Wait a second. Let me use this thing. Okay. We're going to talk about chapter 12. But before we do that, let's talk about what was in the paper. I was shocked. Normally the paper has one or two really nasty things in it. Uh, but yesterday... There were one or two nasty things on page one. Uh, Pruitt woman killed after being dropped off by police. This was in Grants. I don't know where Pruitt is. It must be around Grants someplace. A Pruitt woman was accidentally run over and killed Saturday evening on the New Mexico Highway 122. Uh, after she and a companion were assisted by the Milan uh, Police Department officer and given a ride to the county line near the Blue Water Dairy Queen, so be careful when you're, you eat at that Dairy Queen, <laughs> I guess. Okay, so they transported, she was 32 years old, the guy, with, her name was Dina McGay, and his name was Kevin Joe. Uh, she was 32, he was 33, he's from, I, it's not Thoreau, how do you pronounce it? Thoreau? Thoreau? Is that the way you uh, May said that uh, Sergeant David Chavez was traveling west on New Mexico 122 after 6.30 p.m. when he came upon a couple, of a couple of vehicles stopped in the roadway. Chavez got out of his vehicle and went to see why traffic was stopped, and that's when he found the dead woman on the highway. I know, as nasty as that sounds. He found her on the highway. Where is she? There she is. Uh, he dropped her off, the, the cop dropped her off, and then she went out and raped, laid down in the middle of the highway, in the middle of the road. Her boyfriend, or whatever the Mr. Joe was to her, uh, tried to get her out of the road, and a car came by and ran over her and hit him and killed her and knocked him into the side ditch. Anyway, she died, and uh, the other guys hurt. That's on page one, but it gets better. Three men are arrested in evening drug raid. This is in Gallup. 
drug capital of New Mexico. Isn't it? I know it's number one. Okay. Uh, Anthony Daggett, 42, was charged with possession of a controlled substance. Uh, they found uh, black tar Mexican heroin in the house. I know, I'm, I was excited too. They also found a baggie full of, uh, I, I say baggie, but it was really a garbage bag, <laughs> full of marijuana. <laughs> and then they also found some crystal meth. Three guys were arrested. Uh, Francisco, Anthony Francisco Romero, uh, Joe Anthony Daggett, and Ralph Garcia were arrested for possession. Okay. It gets better. <laughs> so we killed one lady. Oh, okay, this is really kind of interesting. Uh, we have three people arrested for drugs. Uh, authorities uh, are focusing on DNA and Albuquerque girls killing. Um, you, you remember the girl that they killed and they raped and killed and then dismembered her and tried to burn her body. Okay. okay. Uh, they're looking, the FBI is looking at uh, DNA from the case. Uh, she was a 10 year old girl, of course. Uh, but they're looking at DNA from the case. They think there may have been a fourth person involved in the whole situation. Uh, they've, of course, they've arrested the mother, the boyfriend, and the boyfriend's cousin uh, for uh, murder. And now they're looking for a fourth person. Isn't that fascinating? So they're going to look at the DNA they find on the, the child's body and see if there was a fourth person involved. But if the, the body's burned, isn't the DNA going away if the, if the body gets burned? No. Well, uh, okay. Okay, so where, where is the, the question is where is the DNA? If it's uh, one of the problems with, uh, one of the reasons why if somebody's been raped, that they need a rape kit and they need to do it relatively quickly is because the human body will uh, fight the uh, foreign material and it will try to get rid of it because it's foreign. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why you need, you need to do a rape kit almost immediately. Well, not but, you know, fairly quickly after uh, a woman has been married. Uh, but if it's uh, DNA from un underneath the fingernails? Okay. Yeah, if, so if it's any place else, uh, any place uh, like on the skin, uh, then that's a possibility. If it's mucous membrane, then it will uh, destroy, the, the, the body will destroy. It. But the other question is, how long was she alive after she was raped? Horrible questions you're asking. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Break that down. I know, I know, I know, I know. But so a living individual, their body will try to get rid of that foreign material. Okay. As odd as that seems. Anytime a myth, a man has a sex with a woman, uh, her she sees his semen, his sperm, as alien material. And potentially her immune system try, uh, will combat it. It shall fight against it. Uh, this is in Rochester, New York. A woman drowned her 10 month old baby uh, son in, a, in the bathtub. Uh, police say the boy's mother, 25 year old um, Marquia Mitchell, admitted to intentionally drowning her baby. Officials say the child named Jeremiah was taken to Rochester General Hospital before it was pronounced dead. Uh, police responded to a police call and uh, they found the child in the bathtub, submerged in the bathtub. Uh, here you go. A man arrested for making threats at Colorado Springs Walmart. Remember, they just had the shooting in uh, north, just north of Denver. Colorado Springs is about, I don't know, 15, 75 miles south of Denver. Uh, police in Colorado Springs said 19-year-old man was arrested after he threatened uh, after he threatened people with what appeared to be a rifle inside uh, the Walmart. Uh, he also screamed, I'm here to shoot people. This is for ISIS. <laughs> Turned out to be a BB gun. So, but, you know, somebody could have killed him. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Fourth person shot dead in Tampa in possible serial spree. Wow. What a horrible paper this is. 
A uh, woman who killed four people left threatening message. Uh, this is in, in Bar, Vermont, Vermont. A Vermont woman facing life in prison without parole for killing a state social worker and three of her relatives left a screaming message threatening to kill one of her victims just hours before the shooting. Uh, the shootings were carried out. Uh, the reason she was so upset was because Child Protective Services had, had taken her child away and her relatives are the ones who turned her in. So that's what she was so upset about. And I don't blame her. I would shoot four <laughs> people. I mean, but I, I can understand why she was upset. Uh, so this is a woman. I, I know this is really kind of strange. Here the, the woman uh, drowned her 10-month-old baby. Was she depressed? Like clinically depressed after the child? Right, right, yeah. yeah. The baby blues. Well, this is worse. Probably postpartum psychosis. Yeah. Uh, but her, her kid was nine, nine years old. So I don't think that was postpartum psychosis. Uh, so we've got two women that are killing people and a woman that's committed suicide. It's a bad day for women. Uh, okay. <laughs> you may be right. Okay, this is this is really kind of horrible. Uh, when when child sex is a rape, French to set age of consent. Is a 13-year-old girl old enough to agree to sex with an adult? That's a question that France is asking itself as the government prepares to set a legal age for sexual consent for the first time. I know. They have never had a legal age in, in France. Twice in recent weeks, French courts refused to prosecute grown men for rape after they had sex with 11-year-olds because authorities couldn't prove coercion. In other words, the girls consented to have sex with them. Amid public horror, the government is drafting a bill to say sex with children under a certain age is by definition coercive. Feminist groups plan a protest Tuesday to argue that, that the age should be set at, how old do you think it is? 15. 15. This is a feminist group. Justice Ms. Minister Nicole Bellaval uh, says 13 is worth considering. 13 years old. Wait a minute. What, what grade is that? Sixth grade? 13? Seventh grade? Seventh grade? What do you think? Seventh grade? How smart were you in the seventh grade? <laughs> I, was a, I was a blooming lunatic in the seventh grade. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe females are more mature at the seventh, in the seventh grade. Uh, the age is just one piece of an upcoming bill on uh, sexual violence and harassment. Uh, so the family decided. What if they're a late bloomer? Would that still be consensual? Or would that be I'm sorry? So I was wondering that how. Um, never mind. You don't want to be any too, too gross here. Right? Yeah, I was like, I had to. <laughs> what could be grosser? A left year old. And it's not coercive. Can you imagine? 11 year old, that's the fifth grade, right? Oh my god, a fifth grader? You know, I used to teach junior high school, and uh, the fifth grade was the youngest. I had, a, I had a fifth grade girl who wrote me the nastiest note. I mean, it was nastier than anything I've ever seen before. You know, I wish my wife had written me that note. <laughs> But she's this little tiny thing. Oh, jeez, I was shocked. I took it to the, uh, uh, the counselor, school counselor. <coughs> but she said, oh, she writes those notes to all the, all the male teachers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it scared the shit out of me. It really did. I mean, this little, and she sat in the back of the room and left the note on, on, the, on her chair. And she was just this little tiny thing. She's a lot smaller than all the rest of the girls in the class. Some of the girls were were starting to go through puberty. She wasn't, and I had no idea. I'll tell you what. Maybe it happened at home before. I'm sorry? Maybe it happened at home before. It's possible. 
it's it's very possible. But she was right. Oh my God. She said, I, I was in the military. I had lots of words. You can imagine these military people. They want to have sex with everything. But wow, this was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Pencils, what is this? Even, even the women in the military. I know. That's why I married a female military person. Mm -hmm. Twice. Two of them, okay. Military women are just a ton of fun. Like my husband was in the Marine Corps. He used to say stuff about the women marines. So he told us that um, they call them WMs, women marines. So he goes, acronym for them Wins. is, no, they used to call them walking mattresses. Walking mattresses? That's not funny. I know. <laughs> but how did he Gross. Say? I said, really? He's like, yeah, he's like, how do you know? Yeah, well, I was, I was married to two. Military females, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that about. Them. <laughs> the men are pretty gross, but the women are okay. Anyway, yeah, I was pretty shocked. Uh, I left the school pretty fairly soon after that. I quit. I couldn't handle. It. I mean, it was it was insane. Well, a little girl wrote the, wrote the note and other. Uh, I'd be standing there and somebody come up behind me and press themselves up against me. I'm like, I can't move. And, and sometimes I was, I couldn't go forward, so I had to stand there. You know, here's this lady having a lap dance behind me. You know, this little, it was embarrassing. It was tough. It's tough. <clears throat> Uh, okay, what are we gonna? What are we doing in this chapter? Uh, preparing for trial. Uh, this, this is lawyers preparing for trial. Uh, defendants, defendants in criminal uh, trials ordinarily have a jury trial. Uh, jury, tr jury trial. Am I? But if the opposing party consents, they can choose to have the verdict decided by a judge, and this is known as a bench trial. Uh, if they, uh, uh, rather than having a jury trial, they have a bench trial. The problem with the jury. With a bench trial, with a jury trial, you've got 12 people that you have to convince. With a bench trial, you've got to convince a judge. So if you've got a judge that uh, is fairly liberal, uh, then potentially that's not a bad way to go. Uh, if he's relatively conservative, you better go with the jury because you're probably going to lose. Uh, Calvin and Zeisel. This is a, a famous uh, uh, piece of research that was done back in 1966. Well, how long ago was 1966? That's 34 plus 17. That's 51 years ago. That's a long, long time ago. Uh, so Calvin and Zeisel, 50 years ago, they asked each district court judge in the United States to provide information about recent jury trials over which he or she had presided. And the reality is that back 50 years ago, there weren't that many female judges. There were hardly any female judges. In criminal and civil trials, the judges reported that, that their verdict would have been the same as the jury's actual uh, verdict in about 75% of the cases, and that was 50 years ago, 75% of the time. The judge agreed with the jury. Uh, in only 19.5% of the criminal cases did the jury uh, return a, a guilty verdict uh, where the judge would have ruled not guilty or vice versa, approximately 5% of the cases. Uh, resulted in a hung jury. So about 19.5% of the time. See, juries were actually tougher than the, uh, uh, the judge would have been. In most of the uh, discrepant decisions, the jury was more lenient than the judge. Actually, it looked like the opposite to me. The level of agreement, of course, this is 50 years ago. The level of agreement between the jury and the judge uh, was also high in civil uh, trials. Uh, what accounts for discrepancies between the judge and the jury? Calvin and Zeisel uh, attempted to answer these questions by delving more deeply into the judge's reactions uh, to the cases and comparing them to the jury's verdicts. A few discrepancies apparently resulted from facts that one, one of the parties knew, uh, but the other did not. In some trials, the jury was swayed by the apparent uh, superiority of one lawyer over another. Uh, about half of the disagreements involved jury sentiments, 
uh, situations in which, uh, in the judge's view, the jury verdict was determined by factors beyond the evidence and the law. In other words, they just came up with a, with a verdict because they didn't like the looks of the client, of the uh, uh, person being prosecuted. Uh, maybe it was a racial situation. This has been a problem in the past. Jurors' sentiments uh, play a role in decision-making when the jurors believe that the crime is too trivial for the expected punishment. Uh, and one of the things um, that we find in, um, uh, on the Internet, if you look, uh, there, there are people that are trying to legalize marijuana. And what they're saying is that juries need to decide that this is not a crime. That's what they need to decide. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things that... Uh, we can talk about is the fact that uh, they don't see it. it's too trivial to be a crime. Uh, and that's, of course, is, is one of the movements uh, right now in the United States. Jurors uh, believe that the defendant was already, has already been sufficiently sanctioned. Uh, and jurors believe that the law is unfair. Uh, and that would be pro probably some of the drug laws are seen that way. Jurors see a crime as minor or victimless. Uh, prostitution, for example. Uh, who, who is hurt in the case of prostitution? Who gets hurt? Or is it a victimless crime? Prostitution. Who's the victim? Who should get arrested? Should it be the guy that... the procurer, or should it be the the lady that's pro providing the services. Or a man, I guess, in this case. Who's the, who's the bad guy in this? Is it her or is it him or is it him or? It's mutual. I don't see why it's considered illegal. I'm sorry? It's mutual. That's a good question. If, if everybody, I mean, if it's legal in other places, prostitution's relatively common all over Europe. Uh, in Germany, it's not only legal, but they have brothels. In Amsterdam, they have the red light district where the women stand in front of the, the uh, windows with interesting lights shining on them, with their, themselves barely dressed. Actually, they have to have select areas covered now, once upon a time, of course, they didn't, but now they do it. <laughs> They're trying to close down the red light district in Amsterdam. Now, here's the stupid thing. I've never been to the red light district in Amsterdam. I know, I know, I know. I was there like three times. Uh, twice by myself, not by myself, but with a softball team. And, of course, all the guys went down there. I guess I'm not a guy because I didn't go down. I was working on a paper or something. Anyway, I didn't go down there. But guess who has been down there, damn it? My wife has. I know. I've never been to a strip joint, but my wife has been to all kinds of strip joints. This isn't fair. <laughs> Evidently, I'm not really male. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. And my, maybe my wife is. So this is really confusing. She's been to strip joints where women took off their clothes. She <laughs> She was at the officer's club one night, and uh, <laughs> she was talking to this lady. She was drinking a beer, and she was talking to this lady that was sitting beside her. And uh, uh, she didn't even think about what the lady was wearing. I guess she didn't even notice. But uh, uh, the lady said, it's really been nice talking to you. Maybe we can talk later. And she got up, and uh, she took off her, her uh, she had a, some kind of a, I don't know, Order something on. Anyway, she took it off. She's completely naked. She went up there and she was dancing. And here's who my wife was talking to. I know, it's kind of strange. That's not fair. I should have been there. <laughs> I would have I would have talked to her. I, I'm a nice guy. I'll, I would have talked to her. I don't know. I don't understand. Anyway, okay. So what's going on? Victimless crime, uh, that is always a, uh, as a problem. So prostitution in, in Europe, it's not considered illegal, but in the United States it is. Who are they hurting? Who is the victim here? Well, the victim is theoretically the, the uh, community. 
That's the idea. And that's why it's illegal every place except one county in, in uh, Nevada uh, has uh, legalized prostitution. Uh, critique of Calvin and Zeisel for one thing was 50 years ago. Judges were permitted to choose which trials or, or trial or trials that they reported on. Uh, only approximately 500 out of the 3,500 uh, 3, judges provided responses. That's what, one seven? Yeah, it's one seven. Is that right? Do the math. Who's the math guy? Do we have a math guy? Yeah, it's one seven. Uh, juries have changed in many ways since uh, the study was conducted. Uh, the, one of the ways that it, it has changed in the last 50 years is diversity. We have more diverse uh, juries than we, we did 50 years ago. We have only the judge's attribution of what the uh, jurors' feelings and the sentiments were. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of flaws to this research. Uh, of course, it was 50 years ago. Updating criminal case comparisons, Eisenberg et al. in uh, 2005 collected data from jurors, judges, and attorneys in more than 350 trials. The rate of jury judge agreement was about 70 percent. Uh, and of course, that's what, Zy uh, what uh, the other two, uh, Calvin and Zeisel, found about 75 percent. Uh, when they, there was disagreement, juries were more lenient, very similar to the Calvin and Zeisel work, of course. Uh, uh, circumstances in which jurors were more likely than judges to return not guilty verdicts. Jurors were more impressed than judges by the presence of a third party defense witness. Usually it's not the defendant. Uh, jurors were impressed by the absence of a prior uh, criminal record uh, more than the judge was. Of course the judge tells them you can't look at his criminal record. A lot of times it's not admitted in court. But if they know that this guy is a, uh, has committed these kinds of crimes before, a lot of times they want to take him off the street. Uh, so the judge, he's not allowed to even think about this kind of stuff, and, but the juries can. They, can. they can return any answer. Are you starting to write with your left hand? It's, oh, are, yeah. Are you, <laughs> it's just like today he started writing with his oh, left no, hand. I've been doing it for longest. Okay. <laughs> it's right. randomly doing it to snoot. <laughs> Should I try to read your handwriting? It's probably much better. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> Claremont and Eisenberg in 1992 examined plaintiff win rates in federal uh, cases tried before either ju juries or judges from 1979 to 1989. Differences emerged in products, liability, and medical malpractice cases only. Plaintiffs had more success uh, with judges, about 48% win rates than with juries, 28% win rates. Uh, so in everything except uh, the products liability and the medical malpractice cases, uh, the juries were returning uh, much greater uh, 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 awards uh, to, the, uh, to the plaintiffs uh, than the judges were. Uh, so I guess if, if that is the case, the uh, case is a medical malpractice case or a product liability case, uh, the lawyer probably wants to uh, try it before a judge rather than a jury. The juries notoriously are uh, not very nice to uh, uh, large corporations and doctors, people with a lot of money. Researchers attributed the differences in civil cases to selection effects. Uh, the selection of cases tried by juries differed from those tried by judges. Defense lawyers tended to settle cases in which the plaintiff had a strong case, typically leaving juries to decide relatively weaker cases for the plaintiff. Uh, thus, they appear to make different uh, decisions than judges do. Uh, but of course, they were weaker cases. Anything that was uh, was a slam dunk, uh, the juries didn't really get to, to see. They uh, those were settled out of court. Another question is whether jury uh, awards for punitive damages are different from awards assessed by judges and whether the two groups differ on the reasons of those awards. Eisenberg et al. in 2002 found that judges and juries did not differ substantially. They awarded punitive damages of about the same size, although the range of the jury awards was somewhat greater than that of the judicial awards. So what happens if AT&T loses their case? What happens if the tobacco companies lose their case? Well, in the case of the tobacco company, that was so heinous and so egregious what they had been doing that they they settled right away. Uh, in the case of AT&T, it still hasn't been settled, I don't think. 
Nobody's a, nobody has contacted me anyway. <laughs> so I assume that it still hasn't been settled. Uh, one of the, but AT&T did, or at that time it was Bell Telephone. Bell Telephone did had, have to uh, uh, fragment itself. Once upon a time there was one Bell Telephone all over the United States. Uh, at that point they had to, to uh, chop their holdings up. Uh, so there was a Southern Bell, there was a Western Bell, uh, there was a New England Bell. Uh, they had to chop everything all up. See you, Curtis. I won't punch you next time. I promise. <laughs> Jury selection begins as officials assemble a panel or veneer a veneer a. <laughs> announce this word incorrectly almost every time. Uh, that's where they're trying to impanel the jury. Uh, jury selection must neither uh, systematically eliminate nor underrepresent any subgroups of the population. Wow, this is a tough one. So if you live in Chicago, where the population is 30% African American. The jury should be about 30% African American. It's about 20% uh, Hispanic. So it should be about 20% Hispanic. Uh, but some of these subgroups are really kind of interesting. Chicago has a lot of uh, sections in their town. So they have a, an Italian section, they have a German section, they have a Polish section, a huge Polish section. It's like 10% of the population is Polish. And a lot of those people don't speak English. They have published newspapers in Chicago. In Chicago. To encourage representativeness, uh, U.S. Supreme Court cases since 1880 have forbidden systematic or intentional exclusion of religious, racial, and other cognizable groups from uh, jury panels. In other words, if somebody's African-American, somebody's Jewish, you can't exclude them because of their religion or, or because of their race or ethnicity. So if you impanel a jury, then that cannot be a reason for not allowing those people to be impaneled. Uh, but historically, most venires uh, had middle-aged, well-educated white men overrepresented. And if we look at a, uh, uh, a, a jury from the 1940s or the 1950s, or the 1930s or the 1920s, almost everybody is a white male. No women, no minorities. And this was occurring until about the 1970s. So why didn't they impanel minorities? Black people, Hispanics, Natives, Asians, I'm sorry? Why didn't they impanel them? What's wrong with minority before the 1970s? Before the Civil Rights Act were... were well, that's what I say, the Civil Rights Act. Right. Why wouldn't they do, didn't they do it before? What was their excuse? Well, they weren't inferior kids. So what kind of inferiority are we talking about? Education? Oh. <laughs> Education. However, the system forced these individuals in, into a poor education. And then they, the, the legal system said, well, we can't impanel them because they're not as smart as everybody else because their education isn't as good. <laughs> I tried to write with my left hand. Well, you wouldn't be able to read it. <clears throat> Neither would I. <laughs> the United States Supreme Court and Congress established the requirement that uh, the pool from which the jury is selected must be a representative cross-section of the community. Two reasons for this. This would result in juries that were more heterogeneous. And the advantage to that would be that minority members might discourage majority members from expressing prejudice. So the idea was, if we impaneled more minorities, then the white people on the board will not be able to show off their prejudice. They will be less likely to, to act in a prejudicial manner. Heterogeneous juries would be better fact finders. They could examine facts from different points of view. Well, the, and the education wasn't important. 
In this case, the education wasn't important. Because we're looking, we're looking for a group of individuals that uh, are seeing things from, from a different angle. And for that reason, the education wasn't really, wasn't that important. So they needed a person that knew about cars. They needed a person that, uh, that understood uh, what uh, growing up uh, poor meant. Uh, they needed somebody that understood the educational structure that the individual that was being tried uh, uh, knew or understood. Jury representativeness would give the appearance of legitimacy. Juries should uh, reflect the standards of the community when certain components of the community are systematic, systematically excluded from jury service, the community is likely to reject both the legal process and its outcomes as invalid. And of course, I hear this uh, here on the reservation, uh, that uh, you don't think the legal system is, is very good. And maybe you're correct, maybe that's, that is correct. I hear the same thing in, in African American communities. I hear the same thing in Chicago with the Hispanic community. They say exactly the same thing. And mainly it's because they're not being, they're not being put on the juries. As strange as that may seem. So if we impaneled a jury in Gallup, and it, all, and it turned out to be all white people, would that be a fair jury for a, uh, an, individual, an, an individual that was a native? What is the break? What is the demographic breakdown in Gallup? I'm not exactly sure. I don't know. Maybe we should look it up. I can do that. <laughs> I have that capability. Are you ready for this? Uh, okay. Wait a second. If I've got the, I don't have the internet. Okay. Rats. All right, forget it. I could look that up if I had the internet, but I don't have the internet. Okay. Uh, how do courts go about forming the venere in order to make the jury representative? For many years, voter registration lists were used as a primary source for jury pool selection, but such lists underrepresent segments of the community. There are a lot of people that don't want to vote. Uh, this was a problem that we had with uh, native populations in the United States. This is a problem they had in, Minis in, Minis in Montana uh, for a really long time. And then we started getting more liberal presidents. And after that, the, uh, the native population up there wanted to vote. Uh, and the, the voter list got larger and larger and larger. Um, natives represent about 6% uh, of the population up there. Uh, the number of, uh, of uh, Republicans and Democrats in the state among the white population is right about the same. It's pretty close to the same. It's a, kind of a conservative state. So it's about 52% uh, to 48%. So let's mix in the native population. If the natives are voting a liberal ticket, that means the Democrats win. If they don't vote at all, that means the Republicans win. I know. So one of the things that we tried, I tried to do while I was there, I was there for 10 years, one of the things I tried to do was get people to vote. And I had some friends on the reservation who, uh, who were also in favor of everybody voting. And uh, the last year I was there, we've, we uh, elected a Democratic governor and we elected a Democratic senator from that state. We could never get a Democratic member of the House of Representatives, but we were able to elect a Democratic senator and a Democratic governor. And as long as the natives continue to vote, and that's, there's seven reservations up there, as long as, as people vote on all the reservations, then they actually are the ones that control the politics in the state. I know, that's kind of exciting, isn't it? So they have to be nice to the natives in order to get them to vote for them. However, if they can limit the number of natives that are coming out to vote, if the Republicans can, 
I know. Guess who wins? The Republicans win. I know. Oh, I found the demographics. Sort of. Oh, you did? Oh, good. Um, so, um, there's apparently 40% white, um, African American, 1%, 36% or 37% is Native American, American, and then white group 1% of Asians and other ethnicities are Asian, and then. Uh, oh, Hispanic. Yeah. Hispanic, yeah, they have Hispanic. There's um, there's. Um, Hispanic, they don't really, and then there's Mexican, there's Puerto Rican, so there's 33% of Hispanic, Mexican is 16, 17%, Puerto Rican's like not even like half a percent, I guess. Wow. And Cuban is 4%, and then other ethnicities of Hispanic is 16%. Well, that's, then, isn't that fascinating? We got 40% white, we have 37% native, and the rest of them are. are Primarily Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And point. then there's um, some that are um, biracial, five percent, and then other races that are not mentioned, four, fifty percent. Okay. And that's a two thousand, two thousand census. Okay. So it's it's kind of like thirty percent, thirty percent, thirty-three, thirty-three, thirty-three. So it's it's fairly well divided. It jumped up in two thousand seventeen. Oh. I couldn't find that one. So I think the closest one. Isn't that fascinating? Since the, the first census and the second census, they have flip flopped from majority white to majority uh, native. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. It's not that bad. So, who is that? <laughs> it's not that bad. It's much better than that. Well, that's not bad. <laughs> it's, it's your your right hand handwriting is really atrocious. So yes, no, which, no, it's, 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 <laughs> which yeah. makes your left-handed handwriting look better. So, good job. <laughs> fascinating, fascinating. Okay, so if we were going to impanel a jury in Gallup, the majority of the people on the jury would be would be native. And the second largest population would be white, probably, and then Hispanic. Okay. Which was kind of interesting because the three guys that were arrested are named Doggart, what was it, Daggett, Romero, and Garcia. Okay. I don't know. Now here's one of the odd things about Hispanic names. They don't have to be Hispanic to have a Hispanic name. There are some Pueblos, yeah, where, yeah, they were, they all had, had Hispanic names. Yeah, it really all depends on, on the, the Spanish and, and whether they forced them to take Hispanic names or not. So we see a lot of natives with Hispanic names. You go down to uh, the, uh, who are those guys? The Hano Odom, down on the Mexican border. Yeah, they have a lot of Hispanic names. So it's really hard to tell. These, all, all these guys could be native, or they could, two of them could be, yeah, of Mexican descent. You have to look at their pictures to determine that. The guy with all the tattoos up to his, his neck, I don't know. We have one guy that's inked up, so I don't know who he is. Okay, how do courts go about forming the venere? Okay, so uh, yeah, we were talking about, uh, it just flip-flopped in, in, in Gallup. Uh, recently, other sources such as lists of driver's license, dri uh, licensed drivers has supplemented voter lists as a source of prospective jurors. And the question is, who votes is the question. Does everybody vote? Uh, should we only use voters? Uh, in some places, only males vote a lot more than females do. So your voter list is going to be mostly male. For those persons who are eligible for jury duty, members of the venere are uh, randomly selected and, and summoned to appear at the courthouse for jury service. But as many as half of, of qualified jurors ignore the jury summons, even though doing so constitutes a violation of the law. <sighs> yeah. So they call out 100 people and they only get 50. So what are they going to do with those other 50? Well, they can 
they can find them, uh, I don't know, it's $15 or $25 or whatever. They can find them, but they're cer certainly not going to get them to come in. Uh, also, you can, you can get excused from jury duty. I always do. Nobody wants a PhD in psychology to be a juror. I have a question. What if you move a lot and you don't say the same things? You still get You mean like military people? Yeah. It's like if you happen to live in Texas and you got a summons, but you live here in your own Yeah, I got a summons uh, to, for jury duty in Iowa last year. Okay. And so I wrote them and said I was, I was working in, in uh, Arizona. Because I got summoned there in Arizona that month after. I'm like, no, oh, please don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're going to fly home. <laughs> thousand dollars that's not gonna happen but as many as half the quote okay so we're weird so. okay so what's going on what else is going on uh, in an effort uh, to determine if prospective jurors are prejudiced uh, the judge and or the attorneys question prospective jurors in a procedure called voir dire voir dire uh, who asks the questions what questions are asked and how they are phrased how long the questioning goes on and whether the questions are posed to individual jurors or to a group are all matters left to the judge's discretion. So sometimes the judge asks the questions, sometimes it's the attorneys that ask the questions, uh, but somebody has to do it. Uh, if you ever watch this stuff on television, it's usually the prosecuting attorney or the defense attorney, and each of them gets, gets a turn. We're going to talk about that in just a second. A limited form of voir dire uh, involves yes or no questions asked by the judge and answered by the, the group, not individuals. Yes or no questions offer little insight into the juror's beliefs and attitudes. Uh, this form of questioning requires jurors to identify and report their biases. Many may be unaware of their biases and or hesitant to publicly state them. Uh, the social desirability effect may be a factor here. So no matter how they're thinking, a lot of times they'll just answer in a positive fashion. Thinking, of course, that they need to make themselves appear more socially positive. So they'll lie, even though they're under oath. Because they don't want to seem, they, if they don't like African Americans, they don't want to say, I hate those people. They won't say that in public. That's the way it normally works. Extended voir dire in, the, uh, in which the judge and the attorneys ask open-ended questions and question jurors individually has advantages in uncovered biases. Open-ended questions encourage jurors to talk more about their feelings and their experiences. Individual questioning can result in disclosures that jurors might not otherwise offer. In other words, if you don't ask them the question, they're certainly not going to give you that information. But extended voir dire can take a long time, so most courts uh, tend not to favor it. Uh, typical voir dire uh, procedures involve a compromise between the limited and the extended versions. Both the attorneys and the judge pose questions to a group of prospective jurors, and then they ask brief follow-up questions of selected individuals. They can, uh, a trial, a mistrial can be declared if there is a problem with one of the jurors. If they find that the juror uh, has a, a certain prejudice, uh, then uh, they can uh, declare a mistrial. And judges don't like mistrials. They only want to do it once. They don't want to do it twice. If they get a mistrial, it's a black mark on their, on their record. And nobody wants a black mark on their record. Challenges for cause and preemptory, uh, preemptory challenges. Uh, those are two mechanisms by which panelists are excluded from serving on the jury. Uh, challenges for cause and preemptory challenges, and that's usually how I uh, get out of jury duty, is because I'm a PhD in psychology. Challenge for cause in any trial, each side uh, can claim that particular uh, jurors should be excluded because they are biased, they have a relationship with one of the parties, for example, that uh, would be a, a reason to exclude somebody. Uh, maybe they are an insurance salesman, and it's, uh, it's a uh, trial dealing with insurance fraud. Uh, of course, they wouldn't want a, an insurance salesman to be on the panel. Each side has an unlimited number of challenges for cause, uh, so potentially they can go through the entire venere, uh, potentially they could, and not select any jurors. 
Uh, each side may also exclude a designated number of prospective jurors with a, without a reason uh, stated. Uh, the number of preemptory challenges for each side varies among jurisdictions. Uh, the type of case and the seriousness of the charge as to how many people they can just exclude for no reason whatsoever. Preemptory challenges have multiple purposes. Preemptory challenges allow attorneys to challenge potential jurors who they believe will be unsympathetic to their client for whatever reason. And of course, if you've ever watched Bull, and I'm not telling you, you have to watch Bull, but if you've ever watched Bull, that's his job. I know, it's a, I did, it's a kind of a crappy show. My wife loves it. I haven't figured out why yet. Ugh. Anyway. So when she, when we, the two of us are together, I have to watch the whole thing. Maybe she likes Dr. It was on last night. I'm sorry? Maybe she's the one with Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil. <laughs> my, my head's getting bold. Maybe, maybe she'll fall in love with me. <laughs> <laughs> it could happen. Oh, boy. Right. I don't look like Dr. Phil. He's tall. He's got a Texas accent. He is from Texas. I know he's from Oklahoma. Preemptory challenges allow those in, the, in a lawsuit to play a role in selecting the people who decide the outcome, thus they may be more satisfied with that outcome. Uh, preemptory challenges also allow the attorney to begin to indoctrinate prospective jurors and influence those who ultimately will make up the jury. And that is preemptory challenges. One more slide and then I'm quitting. I'm out of here. Everybody else has left me, so I had to sit back. He's all ready to go, damn, why isn't he finished yet? <laughs> time's going so slow, this is terrible. How can he slow time down so much? <laughs> no exclusion on account of race or gender. The Supreme Court has ruled that preemptory challenges may not be based solely on a juror's race or gender. So if you, dis uh, you disqualify somebody for no reason whatsoever, and they are of a select race or of a select gender, you can't do it. The Supreme Court says you can't. Batson versus uh, Kentucky, uh, in 1986, they determined no exclusion based solely on race. And of course, this was happening in the state of Kentucky. Bastards. Oh, I didn't say that. I didn't mean that. I meant something else. <laughs> Why don't we stop right here? And we'll pick it up later. We'll, we'll make times go normal speed for it.